Hello, this is a video about the theory of production section of business economics and the distribution of income. Massive mouthful there. Section of economics, a two level, unit three. We're going to start this section by looking at some of the costs that are faced by firms in the short run. So this is costs of production. We have total costs, which are fixed costs plus variable costs. And there's also semi-variable costs, but we don't really think about those too much. Fixed costs basically don't vary as output changes. For example, rent doesn't change as output changes. You'd have to pay your rent. Um, maybe the workers are on a full-time salary, that sort of thing. Semi-variable costs have a fixed and variable element. So think of a telephone contract. You have to pay so much every month for landline usage usually, plus a bit more on top for calls. So you might have to pay, you know, 2p a minute or something for your calls. Then we have variable costs, which are costs of production that vary directly with output. So this is primarily the raw materials and the electricity. So if you're making three books, obviously the amount of trees you're going to have to kill is going to be more, so the amount of money you're going to have to pay for the paper from the trees is going to be more, so you're going to have a higher cost of production. I believe we have a pretty diagram down there which shows costs against output really and as you can see as output increases costs increases and we're going to look at that in more detail later but that is your general thing you know short term sort of thing so variable costs will increase fixed costs will stay the same for output and total costs are going to increase and uh, I was uh, feeling quite cool there and I coloured each line the same as I coloured the stuff earlier yeah talk about having too much spare time we're now going to take a really quick look at costs over time. In the short run, fixed costs and production scale remain the same. For example, we have a factory which produces 10 sticks of rock every week. In the short run, it will continue to produce 10 sticks of rock. So the production scales remain the same, and because we're producing the same amount of rock, the fixed costs are going to remain the same. Obviously, in the short run, you can increase productivity, which is why variable costs might differ slightly. So say you had five workers making these ten sticks of rocks, they're pretty slow workers, but you know, hypothetical example here, and you train them a bit and they all increased in productivity, except for maybe Bob. Bob didn't do a very good job, didn't respond very well to the training, so you're just going to get rid of him because the other workers can continue to produce the same output, they don't really need Bob. Just to clarify, when I say they're making the same output, I mean the same output that they had when they had Bob with them as a member of staff as well. So they're making 10 before with Bob, they've got rid of Bob and they're still making 10, which is why variable costs can decrease slightly in the short run. In the long run, all factors become variable and output scale can change. So this could be anything, this could be a massive growth of the company, it could be from being this small little local company to being a massive MNC or something like that. But we're going to look at the long run in a lot more detail later. Woo! Moving on to marginal returns. You can tell this is the start of a whole series of videos because I'm being really enthusiastic. You'll get to the last video and I'll be half asleep making them. So marginal returns. First definition is marginal product, which is the output added by each extra unit of a factor, which basically means each worker in the case we're using here. What you'll typically expect to see with the marginal product is that it'll increase for a bit and then it'll decrease for a bit. Uh, we'll see this later on a diagram, I think it might be on the next slide or the slide after that. So basically, say we've got a factory with zero workers, it's obviously got zero output. We add Jeremy, he now increases the output to 10, so Jeremy's marginal product is 10. Then we add Margaret, Margaret is going to increase the scale of production to 22, so Margaret's marginal product is 12. Then we're going to add Clarissa, who is going to take the output to 35, so her marginal product will be 13, I believe, but these calculations are all in my head trying to remember the numbers I've just said, so they could be totally wrong. And that'll go on and on and on, and then it will start to slowly sort of decrease. So maybe we'll, a bit later on when we've got 12 workers, we might add Jonathan, and Jonathan's going to come, and he's only going to add an extra two units of output, and we're going to look at reasons for this later. It's got a name, it's called the Law of Diminishing Returns. Nice posh words there. Average product, this is a slightly easier concept. It's basically the total product divided by the number of workers. So essentially how much each worker is making if we divide the total amount being made by the number of workers. Say we've got a factory producing wristbands. They produce 100 wristbands a day and we've got five workers. So each worker, I believe, will make 20 wristbands on average. So the average product is 20. 
average product will follow a very similar pattern to marginal product, so it will rise and then it will start to decrease as the number of workers in the firm increases. And I just went and had a cookie for anyone that's interested and then looked at the label and was horrified by the 25% of your average saturated fat that you're meant to have content. Ugh. We're now going to have a diagram which shows the impact of adding an increasing number of a variable factor, we're going to say workers here, um, the impact of adding that to a production process. So at the start as we increase we're going to have increasing marginal returns which means that the addition of extra workers adds more output than the previous extra worker. So extra worker number four adds more output than extra worker number three and so on and so forth until we get to the base there which is called the optimal output this is because it's the combination of fixed and variable factors which produces the lowest average cost so this is ideally where firms are going to be producing if they want to have the lowest average cost which means they can have the lowest prices which makes them the most competitive carrying on there as you see extra workers are going to add less and less so that's called the law of diminishing returns or diminishing marginal returns so the amount added to the total output by each variable is going to eventually decrease reasons for this might be due to overcrowding we've got a factory that's really suitable for 12 workers when we reach 12 yeah that's great we're probably at the bottom of the curve there at the optimal output we're producing that amount and another five workers it's just going to get cramped people are going to be getting in each other's way say we've got you know five machines and 15 workers all trying to use them it's not going to be good and this is going to cause productivity to fall and so average costs to rise we've now got a little equation for average cost which is quite obviously total cost divided by the number of units of output produced so say we are making 10 books and the fixed costs are five pounds and the variable costs come to five pounds we've got a total cost of 10 pounds divided by uh, 10 books, so average cost is £1 per book. Marginal cost is the amount added to the cost of production by the next unit of output, and this tends to decrease over time for a bit and then it will remain constant and then increase, and we'll see that a bit later. Actually, change of plan looks like we're going to see it now. This diagram looks quite complicated and it's got a lot of curves, but the only ones that are really of interest to us are the marginal cost curve, which is purple, and the average total cost curve, which is blue. And we can see that when the marginal cost is below the average, which is going down there, <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying that, going down there, you kind of need to see me pointing at the screen to see that. But essentially, when the marginal cost is below the average, the average cost is falling, because for each extra unit of output, it's cheaper to produce it. So the average total cost is going to be falling. I'm going to give you a quick example. We're producing 10 books currently at total cost of £10. So that's average of £1 per book. We're going to add another book and it's only going to cost 50p to produce this book. So now we've got a total of um, £10.50 of costs. And 10.5 divided by 11 is obviously less than 1, so average costs are currently falling. When average total costs are at their lowest point, this is the point at which the marginal cost curve is going to cut across it. It's very important to remember that the marginal cost curve will cut the average cost curve at its lowest point. And then following that, when the marginal cost is above the average, the average cost will be rising. It is possible to have long run growth without diminishing returns. Typically you're going to need to move into a larger factory or maybe introduce specialisation. And obviously to have long run growth you're going to have different combinations of factors. So we're going to say the red curve there at A is going to be fewer workers in a smaller factory. And maybe at C we've got a larger factory and more workers. And we also have to inc assume increasing returns to scale, so as output increases, uh, the average total cost per unit is going to fall. And this is going to be primarily due to economies of scale, really. And you'll see that we've got a separate average total cost curve for each level of output, because obviously as the level of output increases, we're going to have different costs. So for C, we've got a bigger factory, so that's going to cost more for rent, and we've got more workers, so that's going to cost us more. So average total cost curve is going to have changed. Although due to economies of scale, average costs have actually fallen, which is why the sort of downward trend really in the position of the average total cost curve on the diagram. We're now going to have a look at this lovely diagram, which is the long run average total cost curve. It's actually very simple and I really like it for that reason. 
We can see increasing returns to scale along number one. This is due to economies of scale, which is when an increase in factor inputs leads to a more than proportionate increase in factor outputs, which evidently causes average total costs to fall. Then we're going to have a bit where there's constant returns to scale, so we have an increase in factor inputs lead to a proportional increase in factor outputs, which is that flat bit along there, number two, from A to B. And that also has another name, which is the minimum efficient scale, which I believe is on the next slide. And then we have number three, which is the sad case of decreasing returns to scale due to diseconomies of scale, which I believe are coordination, cooperation and control. Though if you want more detail on that, then go watch one of the Unit 1 videos from last year. And this occurs when an increase in factor inputs leads to a less than a proportionate increase in factor outputs. Tragic, tragic situation. As promised, here is the slide on the minimum efficient scale, which is often shortened to, abbreviated to, MES. And we know that this is the lowest point on the long run aggregate total cost curve, and it's the point at which a firm has long run productive efficiency. And we know that productive efficiency is when a firm has the maximum output at the minimum average cost. And I think it's in the next video we get to learn the joyous distinction between productive and allocative efficiency. So why, may you ask, would firms like to be at the MES? Well, firms at the MES are more competitive because they've got lower average total cost, so they can supply their goods at lower price. So consumers think, ah, that good is cheaper, and they buy it. The output required to meet the MES depends on the industry, so you'll have some industries where to get to that low point on the long aggregate total cost curve, it's not too hard, so you don't need to have that much output to get there, but for some industries, you might have got a massive, massive amount of output you've got to have before you get to that point, in which case a monopolistic structure is the most efficient, so it's good to only have one large firm producing in the market because that way we have the lowest prices. If we've got a market with lots and lots of firms selling their goods, we're not going to be able to reach that position on the curve, and so we're not going to have the lowest prices, which kind of sucks for consumers. Another way of getting around this problem is by exportation. Firms could export their products to increase the size of their potential market, which can enable them to have the ability to increase their output, because if they've got more people willing to buy their products, they can sell more, so you'll be able to produce more, so hopefully you'll be able to get closer to that MES, that ideal place on the curve. I remember when I first saw this curve, I wanted to cry, because it looked so terrible. Fortunately, I gradually learned to understand it and realised that there were considerably more complicated curves coming up later on in the unit and that this one really was nothing to worry about. This diagram basically shows us the relationship between short run and long run costs. So we've got our long run curve there and our short run average total cost curve there. I really need to stop saying there and there because you obviously have absolutely no idea where I'm pointing. <laughs> As you can see on the diagram, a firm that's producing at the lowest point on its short run average total cost curve is also on its long run average total cost curve. So the bases there touch the long run average total cost curve. So as the scale of production increases, which is going right ways, so we're going right along there as output increases, unit costs are likely to fall. We're now going to look at two scenarios in which there is an increase in output. So we've got a sudden increase in output. So we're originally at point A on the diagram. Suddenly there's this massive increase in demand. Firms think, oh, maybe it's only temporary. So they're not going to increase the scale of their production on a permanent basis. They're doing it very temporarily. So we're going to move along our short run average total cost curve. So unfortunately we're moving away from the optimal output and we're going to increase our unit costs to C if we're going from A to B in terms of output. However, if a firm thinks, ooh, maybe this increase in demand is going to be permanent, they might decide to increase their scale of production in, in the long term. So what we're going to see here is a movement onto the short run average total cost curve number two, which is the lovely purple one. And the firm is going to move down it Obviously that is very, very steep, so tiny increase in output will lead to a massive fall in unit costs. Until we reach the optimal output at the base of the purple curve at BD. And if you look there, the t difference in the short run average total cost curve, if we look at the position A, the price of that is so much higher than the price of 
moving along the long run average total cost curve to position D. So it is very, very advantageous for firms to increase their long run production rather than their short run production in terms of the monetary benefits. However, dun dun dun, there are some primarily smaller firms that choose not to grow and instead overwork their fixed factors because maybe they can't afford to grow, they haven't got the ability to increase their factory size, say you're working in a small factory can only hold 10 people and you're surrounded by houses, you can't really build an extension and maybe the firm can't afford to buy a factory elsewhere or there's none in the area. Also there may be fears that the market growth is temporary, so they think the demand really isn't going to last. They're just going to overwork their fixed factors, whilst the demand is there, and then when the demand subsides, they're going to reduce their production again. Woohoo! That's the end of the first Unit 3 video. Round of applause. <coughs> Only me clapping there. Awkward. Hope this video has helped you understand the concepts. If you've got any questions, just comment them below. And if you want a set of notes, which will be for the whole unit, because I finished my Unit 3 notes, just comment below the email address and I'll send them to you. I'll see you again in the next video. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.